Jesus once said to his disciples, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And certainly in the story of Mark, that Mark is telling, that is not yet two chapters old, we see that those people who were sick with a variety of illnesses, people who were paralyzed, people who had impure spirits, people who had fevers or leprosy, found their way to Jesus. The sick came flooding in, in flocks and in droves. Recently in this story, there have been so many that wanted to be near Jesus while he taught and touched people and in doing those things, making people that had struggled in some way whole, that the people filled the entire house where Jesus was teaching. And that forced four friends who were desperately exercising their faith that their friend who was paralyzed and unable to move off his bed mat just needed to get close to Jesus. And so they literally tore the roof off the home where Jesus was in order to get their friend in proximity to Jesus so that they could get the healing that he sought. They got more than they bargained for with that one. First of all, Jesus declared this man's release from his sins and deaths in this life, and then he healed him of the paralysis that had defined his life up to that point. But that's the thing with Jesus. Just getting close to him had an effect on people, something that changed them from the inside out, whether it was releasing them from their sin, whether they received healing from something that had bound them for years, or whether it was coaxing the monsters that dwelled within each person to come out sunlight being the best disinfectant after all, where those monsters could be named for what they are and dismissed just as quickly. The people who came to Jesus in droves understood what Jesus said to be true. They were sick and they knew it. They wanted healing or release from something, and so they came to Jesus to be made whole. But what about those who did not even know they could come to Jesus? What about those people who didn't have dedicated friends who would literally pick them up on their mat and set them at Jesus' feet? Not everyone has those kind of friends. Or if they do have good friends who are looking out for them, not all friends know exactly where to take you to receive this kind of healing. Everywhere we look in the story of the Gospel of Mark, people were finding Jesus, even when Jesus retreated to the lonely places and didn't seem especially keen on being found. But there were some who may never have found their way to Jesus on their own. And there were some people whose friends might never have picked them up and dragged them to Jesus' feet. And in those cases, it seems, Jesus went and found them. That is what we see with the story of Levi. Levi is one of the people that Jesus found, not the other way around. And Levi seems to be one of those who desperately needed finding because it probably would never have occurred to him to find Jesus on his own. Now, as I waded through the commentaries and discussions of these verses this week, one thing clearly emerged. There's a lot about Levi that we simply don't know. Levi is strongly associated with Matthew, and there's a good reason for this. Jesus called Levi in Mark chapter 2, as we read, but then in Mark chapter 3, they list all 12 of Jesus' disciples, and the name Levi does not appear on there, but the name Matthew does. And in the Gospel of Matthew, there is an identical story of Jesus calling a tax collector to follow him, but that man's name is Matthew. In fact, this Matthew has been associated with, by tradition for some time now with the author of the Gospel of Matthew. And so many people believe that Levi and Matthew are one and the same person. And that might not be so unusual in our Gospels. The Apostle Peter started out his name, or his life, with the name Simon. And then Jesus gave him the nickname Peter. And he is referred to all over the place as Simon. And at other places as simply Peter. And in some places as Simon Peter. And we're just generally supposed to know that this is the same person all the time. On reflection, it seems that Jesus actually quite liked to give people nicknames. For instance, the Apostle Thomas was, had the nickname Didymus, or the twin, and James and John apparently did enough fighting or passionate preaching that they earned themselves the nickname the Bonaires, or the Sons of Thunder. In fact, I think that's kind of a neat detail that we get from the life of Jesus, that he liked to give people nicknames. And the tradition apparently continues in the early church as Saul becomes Paul, at least for the purposes of witnessing about Jesus in Gentile territory. So I find it at least plausible that Levi and Matthew could refer to the same person. And I'm going to continue with the assumption uh, that they are the same person. In fact, as I typed out this message, I 
trying to just slip between the two names, so I may do that as I speak. We'll see. But one thing we do know about Levi is that he was a tax collector. But this is even more difficult to wade through than it might seem at first glance. One writer says this, we must understand what is meant by the term tax. Taxes in the first century were both direct taxes and indirect taxes. Direct taxes were levied on crops, land, and individuals, and indirect taxes included tolls, duties, and market taxes of various kinds. Toll collectors sitting in custom houses, perhaps where uh, Levi was sitting in Mark chapter 2, collected levies on goods entering, leaving, or being transported across a district, as well as those passing crossover points like bridges, gates, or landings. And the conflict between uh, tax collectors or toll collectors and the tradesmen with whom they uh, constantly interacted was quite intense. But there was a wideness in the idea of collecting taxes in the ancient world. In addition, general wisdom is quite uh, certain that tax collectors were all wealthy, and so maybe Levi was quite well off, given his profession, but even this isn't a certainty. It seems that tax collecting was somewhat of a pyramid scheme, where those people who sat at the top were quite wealthy, but those underneath them were a lot less well off. One writer says that tax collectors familiar in the synoptic tradition were, for the most part, employees of the chief tax collector, and thus were often rootless persons, unable to find other work. Evidence from this period also suggests that cheating or extortion on the part of the tax collector would be less likely to benefit the little tax collectors than the chief tax collectors for whom they worked. I've heard a similar comparison with modern-day drug dealers, not that I know from experience, but most of us associate the world of drug dealing with people with great wealth. But the truth is, apparently, that the kingpins of the drug dealing world obtain all these high levels of wealth, and that scared little kid on the street trying to push drugs on his friends makes next to nothing. So it may have been with the tax collectors in Jesus' day. Some of them were quite wealthy, but others were closer to the bottom of the pyramid and therefore quite a bit less well off than we might assume. And Levi, by most assessments, was probably not one of those chief tax collectors, but one of those underlings. And it is impossible from this distance in space and time to tell if Levi was closer to the top of the pyramid or somewhere near the bottom. However, there is also evidence that Capernaum was a fairly highly traded area, and so even, uh, even little tax collectors in that area may have done quite well for themselves. So Levi could quite conceivably have been wealthy, but he could just as easily have been less wealthy than we assume just by judging him from his profession. At very least, Levi was probably not impoverished on a balance of probabilities. I would expect he was at least comfortable, which was not the norm necessarily in Jesus' day with the bulk of people, about 90% is the estimates that I have heard, living on subsistent wages or lower. But for all that we don't know, and all of the guesswork that goes into figuring out Levi's life situation, here is one thing we know for sure about tax collectors. They were unpopular, despised even. And the reasons for this abound. Tax collectors in this community were Jewish, but they collected taxes and tolls on behalf of their Roman oppressors. And they made their money by taking whatever they could convince a person to pay over and above the toll or the tax that they were collecting. So they were widely regarded as dishonest. Not only that, because they were Jewish and they worked for, Roman, uh, for, Roman, for the Romans, collecting their tolls and taxes, they were seen as collaborators with the oppressors. And collaborators with oppressors, as we know, are not seen in a good light at any time. One writer says that the tax collectors of New Testament times were excluded from the society of decent people because of their reputation for dishonesty and their collaboration with the occupying Roman government. Like prostitutes, they had sacrificed something of their human integrity. As an aside, it seems to me that earlier comparison with modern day drug dealers actually might work quite well for us. I suspect we see uh, drug dealers as predatory and dishonest. And so most of us wouldn't want to be known with someone, uh, to associate with someone that we know deals drugs. And I think that's probably similar for tax collectors too. Another, writer, another author writes the following. One biblical commentator says that tax collectors were universally hated and notoriously dishonest. The tax collectors were disbarred from attending the synagogue and were considered unclean by the Jewish law. The Jews of that era looked down on tax collectors. If you recall, in Luke chapter 18, there's a story of a Pharisee that stands up and prays this prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, 
robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. In other words, tax collectors are associated in the same category as robbers and adulterers. Also in Matthew chapter 18, it says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, kick the guy out. Don't have anything to do with him. Ostracize him. He's like a tax collector, so get rid of him. You might also recall another story of another tax collector named Zacchaeus who has to hide himself in a tree in order to get a glimpse of Jesus because he feels he will not be welcome because of his profession. So Levi would probably not have been welcome at most tables and certainly not the table, tables of the pious. And so is it any wonder that it, even if Levi had heard Jesus' teachings and even if Levi was interested or intrigued or felt the pull to get near Jesus, that Levi would have chosen to stay away. If left to his own devices, Jesus is a religious teacher. He was considered worthy to teach in synagogues and to spar with the religious elite of the day. In the Gospel of John, a man named Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, comes to Jesus by night, probably because he didn't feel that he should be seen with Jesus during daylight hours. But Levi probably felt that he wouldn't have been welcome in the company of Jesus day or night. Levi probably labored under the assumption that Jesus would never welcome someone such as him, one who had sacrificed their integrity and reputation on the altar of money and material security. Whether or not that is actually true of Levi, that he was dishonest, is debatable, but the point is that everyone thought that that was true of him. And so if even, even if Levi felt the pull of the magnetism of Jesus that other people seem to have felt, he probably never would have left his tax collecting booth on his own to approach Jesus. Jesus needed, Levi needed Jesus to come find him. And that's what Jesus did. He found Levi as he walked along. He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Even if Levi would never have thought to seek out Jesus on his own, Jesus finds Levi and asks him to follow. And it seems that Levi was only too eager to do so. Like Peter and Andrew, James and John, Levi too answers Jesus' call instantly, getting up out of his booth and following. One writer says this, what Jesus sees in Levi is not just a member of a disreputable profession. He sees a human being with his gifts, his potential, his errors and his wounds. To this human being, he addresses a call, simply, clearly, unbelievably. And as simply, Levi responds, it is perhaps the only thing he can do it is an entirely new beginning. So in the story of Mark, not yet two chapters old, many, many people come to find Jesus, but Jesus also spends time seeking out those who didn't come flocking to him. What might have prevented Levi from seeking out Jesus? Perhaps it was a personal hang-up, such as pride. Maybe if we accept the premise that Levi was wealthy or at least very comfortable, then Levi didn't feel the need to seek someone out like Jesus. Maybe he thought there was nothing that he needed from Jesus. But given the alacrity with which he got up from his booth, I think that there might have been something else going on here. And if we examine the lives of people in our day and age, we know that the lives of the rich and famous are, seemingly miraculously, for all that we crave those things, not really any happier than the lives that the rest of us lead. And so simply stating that Levi was wealthy is no guarantee that he felt happy and fulfilled that he felt whole in the life that he led, and that it was pride that kept him from seeking out Jesus. So what else would keep Levi from going to Jesus on his own? I wonder if it's because he felt that he wasn't welcome at Jesus' side, or in Jesus' movement, in the synagogues and in the temple. If this is the case, then we're left to ponder this question. What is it that might prevent people in our day from coming to Jesus? After all, in our culture, in our place in this world, it's probably quite unlikely that somebody hadn't heard the name Jesus before. And many probably know the story of Jesus, or at least pieces of it. So what prevents them from coming? Is it because they're too prideful? Is it because they don't feel the need for Jesus? Of course, it probably differs from person to person, and it may vary. But many of those who... Uh, know the name of Jesus and yet remain on the outside, never seeking Jesus out, perhaps they do so because they feel that they'll be judged, and negatively at that, by people who call Jesus their Lord and Savior. They don't feel welcome to uh, come to God's house. They don't feel welcome with Jesus' people. 
In my experience, the thing I hear most among my friends who are not yet Christians or who are Christians but aren't terribly observant of the religion is that if they darken the doors of a church, they would be burned up. They don't feel like they would be welcome here. So perhaps one of our jobs as followers after Jesus is to keep our eyes peeled for those who might not feel welcome and find a way to invite them along after all. We're left with this example. Jesus went to find Levi at his tax collecting booth because Levi would never have thought to find Jesus on his own. And maybe it's up to those of us who wish to follow Jesus' example today and right now to go and do likewise. Perhaps we can keep our eyes peeled for those who feel they couldn't possibly come to Jesus and keep company with him because they will not be welcomed. Maybe we can be the ones to invite such people in. Jesus finds Levi because Levi would never have found Jesus on his own. But then beyond even this, in the very next scene, there all these people are sitting around a table together eating a meal. And not only is Levi there, but all of Levi's friends are at that table too. So not only does Jesus welcome Levi himself, but he welcomes all the other tax collectors and sinners that make up Levi's inner circle of friends. And there they are eating with Jesus. In fact, they're probably eating at Levi's house, since in Mark, Jesus doesn't have a house of his own, and Levi has invited all of his friends over. Wherever it took place, however, this meal is even more powerful than it seems at first glance. Jesus and his disciples are in table fellowship with tax collectors and sinners. In the ancient world, eating together was a very powerful symbol. In the book of Acts, there's a story told that involves Peter and a Gentile named Cornelius, in which Peter comes to the realization that Gentiles are to be welcomed into the early church. After this incident, which some people have called the Gentile Pentecost at the ho home of Cornelius, when Peter returns to Jerusalem, he begins to be criticized by some of his fellow Jewish followers of Jesus. And they say to him, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now, Peter has already baptized these people, and so he isn't criticized for baptizing them into the early church. He's criticized for eating with them. Now, in Mark chapter 2, verse 15, this is actually the first time we ever hear the word disciples used by Mark. And there seems to be a distinction between the disciples and the many others who are following Jesus. Perhaps if we did something a little different, like tra translating the Greek word for disciples as students, that might help us see the difference a little more clearly. Learning from Jesus instead of just following him as part of the crowds are two different things. Those who follow Jesus, who were his students or disciples, got a front row seat to everything that Jesus was doing and teaching, but they were expected to do more than just observe. They also had to get into the game. They followed Jesus and they participated in his ministry while Jesus was here on earth. And they were the ones, of course, who carried on the ministry when Jesus no longer walked the earth. I saw the following quote on social media this week. It says, there's a huge difference between you're welcome here and you're needed and you contribute to this community. And when I reflect on Jesus' life, I can't help but notice how often he communicates that second message. He invites folks to actively participate in the world. That is true when Jesus called Levi. Jesus saw Levi sitting there at his booth, and he sought out Levi because he never would have felt welcome on his own. And then Jesus tells Levi, not only are you, are you welcome here, but you are needed here. Jesus needed James and Andrew, John and Peter. Jesus needed Thomas. Jesus needed Mary, and Jesus needed Martha. Jesus needed Joanna, and Jesus needed the other women who supported him out of their own purse. Jesus needs and wants the people who surround him to contribute to his community. And those who follow Jesus are supposed to learn from his example. So what do we learn from Jesus' example here when he takes this up to the next level and eats with all of Levi's friends? Well, Jesus' disciples or students have to follow their teacher in those that they choose to associate with. What do you think Peter thought when he had to sit down with Levi and all of those tax collectors and sinners who were of little repute in that world? We recently mentioned the incident in Acts where Peter sits down with a group of Gentiles at Cornelius' house to eat. I wonder, did the feast that Jesus had with Levi and all his friends cross Peter's mind when he broke bread with Cornelius and his household? 
Did Andrew, James, and John relish the invitation to this particular table? Jesus counted another person among his disciples as well, a man named Simon, who was supposed to have been a zealot. That is, Simon wanted to take up arms and overthrow the oppressive Roman government. You know, the same Roman government that Levi or Matthew was supposed to have been a collaborator with because he spent his days gathering tolls, taxes, and tariffs on their behalf. Would Simon the Zealot have accepted such an invitation to sit down with these people, the tax collectors that sold out to the Roman government and often did all right for themselves while they were at it? Did Matthew or Levi sleep with one eye open every night that he traveled with the other disciples for fear that Simon the Zealot might make his move in the middle of the night? Interesting, isn't it, that Jesus calls Levi or Matthew and says not only does he need someone like Levi, he also needs someone like Simon the Zealot on the team too. Can we learn something from the fact that Levi or Matthew and Simon the Zealot were united in loving and following Jesus, even if they were diametrically opposed to one another politically and in their approach to life? To be associated with Jesus means that we are associated with all that Jesus calls friends. And the thing about the community that Jesus formed is that it was made up of people who were often very different from one another, which is very easy to say in general and from afar, but much harder in practice, as we know. Jesus calls Levi a friend, and all of Levi's other friends are also invited to the table. Would you have come to that feast if it were the, with the likes of those folks? Do you want to come to the table of the Lord only if it's with people who look and think and act and vote like you do? When you join the family of God, you see you don't just get the status of a child of God, but you do get that, and that's pretty cool in and of itself, but you also get a whole bunch of siblings. Can we be more united around our love for and following after Jesus than we are about those other things that define us? Could we sit down with both the Levi's and the Simons of this world? Jesus seeks out and finds those who are unlikely to find him first and invites them to his table because it is the sick who need a doctor. And Jesus has come to call the sinners, not the righteous. Do we have the courage to sit at the table with Jesus and all of his friends? And do we have the eyes to see those who might never come of their own accord and the heart to make room at this table for them too? Would you bow with me in prayer as we close this morning? Lord Jesus, many people found you when you walked this earth, but some of them needed you to look for them and to find them. As people who have found and been found by you, we ask to have the courage to seek out those who are outside your family and to make a place for them here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look on the Lamb of God and be at peace, my friends. As you go from this sanctuary, serve God gladly, serve your neighbor lovingly, serve your loved ones thankfully, and serve yourself kindly. The love of the Holy God surround you, the love of the Holy Christ redeem you, and the love of the Holy Spirit indwell you, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.